Welcome to Ethical Data Explained. Join us as we discuss data-related obstacles and opportunities with entrepreneurs, cybersecurity specialists, lawmakers, and even hackers to get a better understanding of how to handle data ethically and legally. Here to keep you informed in this data-saturated world is your host, Henry NG. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Ethical Data Explained. I'm your host, Henry NG, and today we have a very special guest. Uh, she is an award-winning entrepreneur, international speaker, best-selling author, and advocate for gender diversity and equality in cybersecurity. And in our pre-podcast talk, I've now found out she is an exceptional chef at home as well. I would like to introduce Jane Franklin. Uh, if Jane, if you'd like to do a quick introduction on yourself and let people know uh, maybe not what you cooked uh, for your family the other night, but a little bit more about you and and uh, your kind of experience. Yeah, cheers to that, Henry. Um, so it's so good to be here. Uh, and I've spent 25 years in cybersecurity. Um, I came into security not having had a technical background. So my background is art and design. So I'm qualified in, in that area. I came into um, the industry by actually building my own penetration testing company, which I owned for about 15 years. So that was at a time, you know, when literally there were about less than half a dozen pen testing companies, certainly in the UK, because I'm based in the UK, but it was it was um, really new. Security was really new in those days. So did that. I've worked in some executive positions, um, the last one being as the managing director at, at Accenture. And um, I am I contribute to um, lots of awards all over the world. Some in technology, some in cyber. I've done some in literature as as well, because I'm a published best-selling author. And um, I contribute to standards and forums and things like that. So um, Crest, I was I helped launch Crest. You know, in well, however many years ago, and um, helped formed. Um, uh, no, sorry, helped formed Crest um, when there was a problem with it. And so you might say I'm probably a technically founding member of, of Crest and um, helped to launch Cyber Essentials, you know, all those years ago and um, have contributed through my companies to the likes of OWASP. And the other thing that I do, um, in addition to like working my own business, which is all about helping women get into the industry and develop and, and stay in it and companies to attract um, and retain the, the talent and build those incredible environments that are good for all people is that I really am a bit of a voice for the voiceless. So I am a women's activist and I do research, research to kind of further the mission to uh, make women's standard in cybersecurity and not exception. So I've put about 352 women through my women's scholarships, um, the insecurity um, scholarships in the last four years. And that's a value of about half a million US dollars. Amazing. So Amazing. that's that's who I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, like I said going through our, our pre-interview sheet, this long list of accolades is absolutely amazing. And one of the things that you just brought up is you, you, you're from a design background and you went into pen testing and cybersecurity. Yeah. What led you to do that? What was the kind of switch in the brain that went, okay, well, uh, I've, got, I've got my background in design. Let's try something completely out of my comfort zone. Yeah, well, I'm a challenger by nature. So I, I love challenges. And for me, I, I, was, I was doing so... I needed, I fell pregnant after graduating <clears throat> with my first son. I've got three kids. They, they're young adults. Um, so I fell pregnant with my son and I needed to make a change because although I was working as a, as a designer, I had an agent and I was selling work all over the world, which I vowed never to do. I'm an introvert. And <clears throat> so I ended up doing that. And then I ended up meeting um, a boyfriend who was in technology and he, um, let's, let's open a business together. Let's, let's do this. And because I didn't know much about technology but I was interested you know I said yes I I left a, a good job with great prospects to go and build my own tech company with him and because um of the state of the of technology at that time the only areas that really interested me were security or AI and AI was just too new then I mean it was it was at a time where mobile phones were really new. Email was new. Not everyone had a website, you know, so um, 
security was viable and that's what we did so we built a business um that was initially uh an, an integrator a value-added reseller and we sold high availability high availability servers networking kit and security but we always led with security and then we just scrapped everything and, and focused on security after you know a few years because mm -hmm. i could see where the market was going and then honed down in on, on pen testing of course of course it's funny thing that you said that you uh were never really interested in sales and you kind of ended up in it i feel like a lot of us who are in sales tend to have that same thing like when i graduated from university one of the things i said i was like i'm never going to do sales and eight years into nine years into my career, I'm 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 loving every moment of it. Um, so it's interesting to well, to hear the same thing. <laughs> this is the thing, isn't it? I didn't realize, you know, I've been solving problems you know, over the years. So I wanted to go on holiday with my boyfriend, and it cost money, and no one would give me a job. So I created my own little business. I didn't realize it. I just made things and sold them for a profit. Got the money within two and a half days you know so off I went on holiday you know when I was after graduating I troops around galleries you know asking them to show my you know show my work you know in one of their exhibitions you know all of these things were sales and I didn't realize really that that was selling and that selling really is just helping people you know it's it's a transaction but essentially it's helping people and solving a problem so and um, once I kind of got my head around that, then it was it was easier to do. And that's why I'm such I'm very passionate about quality sales personship. I was going to say salesmanship there, but, <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's a profession. It's mm -hmm. a skill. Skills are learned and you can you can do it really, really well. Um, and, and so, yeah, I'm quite fierce about the quality of ethical selling. Of course, no, especially from a background of kind of ethics and opening, um, opening the cybersecurity world to to everyone. I think being balanced uh, in the mix is always very very important. Um, it's interesting that you said you also had an interest in AI at the time. Like, if if you could go back, well, actually, no, let's rephrase <laughs> that. If you could restart your career right now, do you think at this point in time AI would be the option that you go down rather than cybersecurity? Maybe, yeah. I, I think it would be actually something in tech. You know, I, I really do some, I, I really do. Tech to me is so creative um, and I would really be thoroughly investigating tech. I mean, AI is, is so interesting. I mean, it's just like, you know, with the advancements and the developments, particularly, you know, over the last few months, you know, with um, chat, yeah. uh, GPT, <laughs> you know, it's just like, wow. Oh my God. I love, I love that. It's so powerful. It's just like, it's fantastic. And um, so it can really add and contribute obviously there you know, with any positive there's an equal neg negative um, and and we can see how that could play out and is playing out with 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 ai you know so yeah i i, I do i would i would be much more much more investigative and explorative you know with looking at um technology because it's a big field cyber is just a part of that of course that's brilliant here. Um, kind of bringing it back into that cybersecurity world. Obviously, you've been in cyber for a majority of your career. Um, what have you kind of seen as the major changes, and and what do you feel that hasn't changed over over your kind of time in cybersecurity? Yeah, so major changes are things like language. So, like when I came into it, we were talking about IT security, information security, network security, and um, the the profile, the risk. You know, because there is so much more technology now, we are so much more connected than ever. We have the cloud, um, we have AI, but it's just this connection and and reliance on on the cloud that has changed things. So the the profile of, of security has increased. The risk exposure of security and what we do has increased. You know, I think back to when I came into security, it was you were landed with it, you were given it, you evolved with it. No one had a clue. No one needed to be qualified in anything. It was just like, oh, you're doing this now. It's your responsibility. Sort it out. For so many people, and and their careers developed, you know, that way. Whereas nowadays, you know, there are so many hoops to jump through. You need to be qualified in in this, in that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know, when it comes to leadership. 
you know, the, the um, CISOs, the CSOs, they're under so much more pressure because of the, the risk exposure and just the amount of, of breaches and um, attacks and uh, that that are happening. So it's everything is in abundance. You know, we're at a time of abundance anyway. Mm. You know, and so that's that's a, a huge a huge change that I've seen. And um, in terms of so yeah, and it's got more. It's got a little, I would say a little bit more professional. A little bit. Um, it's <clears throat> it's more diverse than ever before. You know, so before you know, 25 years ago or whatever, it really was technical domain. You know, you needed to be pure tech in order to to be in it. Whereas nowadays, that's not the case. It's so much more diverse. It's it, it's scaled. There are more jobs for so many different types of, of people. And then in terms of like what hasn't changed, uh, we're still really slow. We are not uh, communicating as effectively as we could do. We'd need to do a better job of um, improving our communication and understanding. I think the World Economic Forum um, called that out in, in this year's report. Um, so we need to be much more business-like, much more on the case in terms of, well, what are the other stakeholders doing? How does that impact us? How can we work more, more um, uh, collaboratively? How can we be more aligned and helpful as opposed to the department that likes to say no we, we still got that um going on for for many of us um we need uh more buy-in from the top and that is improving and again the world economic forum stated that in this year's report um so yes we're doing a better job of that we still have low numbers of, of women in in cyber um that's not great at all um and what was the other thing I was going to say? Um, oh, yeah, things like um, secure development life cycle. I mean, like, are we making progress in terms of that? It's got a different name, but I don't really see much change in terms of that. Why, why, are, why aren't these standards being built into products as a matter of, of course? Mm. You know, I, I remember evangelizing about that, blogging about it in 2008 you know in the early 200 2000s rather you know it's it's um i don't see much much development there so those are things that i can think of off the top of my head i also yeah i think we're a bit a bit too slow not great with change which is understandable given you know what we do so we need to be more um open more collaborative um, more commun better communicators, more aligned with other business stakeholders, less defensive, um, <laughs> and uh, more inno more innovative. You know, find ways more resourceful, more innovative. Yeah, of course, I definitely think it's uh, something in, not just in cybersecurity but in tech where I always say technology likes to move fast when we want it to move fast and then other times it just has that slow plodding, plodding pace that you you'll see in a, a lot of cases um but hopefully we can see some fast advancements over the next um i want to say several well, months think, but maybe several years i think tech does you know, we'll put a slowness you know on it it's just like hang on a minute you know what's going on here it's like have you done this yeah you know so it's it's really understanding the businesses needs and working with them so that we we actually achieve our our goals together you know we that's that's what's needed so yeah tech does move fast cyber can move a bit faster um, and we have seen that the pandemic was actually really good um you know for us in so many ways um but it, it really does you know we don't like change we we don't and, and and that's a human trait. Humans work really hard to maintain the status quo, but especially in cybersecurity, change means risks. Change opens up danger. And um, I think we need to be moving with technology as opposed to being more obstructive of it. And we need to be breaking down these doors so that we are building in secure development practices um you know right at the very start so we're lowering exposures and, and bugs and and also not being so wasteful you know so from a sustainability perspective it really helps
Of course. I, I, from what you just said, that kind of idea of waste and sustainability is actually the next point I wanted to raise. Um, so obviously some experts are arguing that data and sustainability analysis are essential to building resilient companies. Mm. Like what are your thoughts on that? And do you have an example of where, you know, a time in your career where you use data to aid in sustainable development? Yes, um, I definitely am a big believer in data. Data can tell lots of different stories. Um, I like building data. I like looking at data. <laughs> I like learning out on data. I probably could have been a data scientist or something like that. I love stats and like patterns and things like that. Um, you know, so so yes, it helps us to be more intelligent about building solutions and really discovering root problems. And and it helps us with the investigative side of, side of things. Um, so, and it's, it's really important that we get a grasp on that um, so that we can actually solve the right problems and, um, and do a better job of that. So data is hugely important. You know, for me in terms of how I've used data, you know, I've looked at certain problems and wanted to investigate them. So is this really a problem? How deep is that problem? So, for example, I did a groundbreaking bit of research on women um, at security events um, and how they were being harassed or having to deal with inappropriate behavior or using their voices as speakers, as panelists, as thought leaders. Um, and and certainly when it came to events, like what they wanted at events in order for them to go to more and be more involved. So I, I did that because I'd heard lots of stories. We'd, we've all heard the stories, but the data hadn't, uh, wasn't, wasn't there. So I, I did a, a study on that to ascertain, well, what is the problem? What do women want? are you using are you women using their voices do they want to speak at events you know i've got conference organizers telling me we can't find telling me they can't find a a woman to speak i've got women telling me that they want to speak you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so what's really going on so that helps to build a picture and it also helps us to look at trends it helps us to evaluate well are we making an impact are we doing any better what's what's going on um and and so that's it's really useful it's it's the start of for me, it's a starting point. And when I was working on the insecurity movement and building the code of conduct, which again is for event organizers and keep all people, um, but particularly women safe at, at events so that they go to, go to more and can have an enjoyable experience without feeling fearful or threatened or not going at all. Um, you know, it was, it, it really needed to be done, you know, so is the code of conduct making a difference? Like, what is the state of affairs? Are we doing any better? So, and, and of course, when we start measuring all of those things, we can improve so that we're not being wasteful, because wasteful is not good for sustainability. It's not good for our planet, you know, we, we, for more human and more electricity more resources and, and so on which just deplete um our, our planet so we we need to get a handle on on that of course and if we're looking at that kind of data and sustainability side what approach would you recommend to kind of businesses to integrate both data and, and sustainability into their say cybersecurity solutions uh, moving forward yeah well it's looking at um really mapping people Profits and planet um, to so these um, three core pillars to securities of people, process, and, and technology. So, <clears throat> for example, I wrote I wrote a blog on this. You know, I've given keynote talks uh, on on this uh, fairly fairly recently, actually last uh, late last year. And so it's really looking at, and I always start with people because that's the foundation. So, what is going on with your people? How can you be how can you be less wasteful in terms of your people? So treating them well, making sure that their needs are being met, making sure that your recruitment practices are unbiased. Um, and there are many things that you can do that because there's so much waste that goes into the people aspect. Um, people not staying at companies. So you're having to 
recruit again so that requires resource um you're having to start projects again or projects aren't being seen through so that there's more waste there so there's a lot that can be done there again on the processes side of things um the secure development life cycle the devops sides is is an instant win so it's really looking at well how can you get into the life cycle earlier so that you are um, fixing bugs sooner and being less wasteful so I think you save something like 75% of your costs, uh, your incident response costs, if you can get in earlier into the life cycle. Um, and about 50% of bugs, I think, can be, um, you can reduce 50% of bugs, again, if you get in earlier to the, to the life cycle. So in terms of that return on investment, you know, it's there. But that's only if um it's it's strategically possible so for some companies they have to be fast to market they can't wait or speed is of the essence so they've just got to get it out and then retrofit but most most companies can afford to do it so the earlier the earlier that happens and the sooner that security and internal audit are involved in that process and um, the the better it is for sustainability and and lowering waste and then just in terms of tech, it's making better decisions. Or you can kind of even go back to procurement with the processes. You know, what are the requirements in terms of, you know, your your processes, your procure, pre, procurement processes? Are you asking for these uh, the, these criteria this criteria to to be met? Um, so that can be built in as a process. You know, are you um, sourcing green technologies? You know, are you using technologies that are better for the environment? How are you evaluating those and those suppliers and vendors and, and so on? So, and, and of course, when it comes to the technology and creating it, we can be creating and innovating with all of these things in, in mind. And I think it's, you know, when you look at the generations, certainly millennials, it's, you know, front and foremost for so many millennials um, and centennials. I found, you know, having um, kids that are young adults you know i i don't think that they're exceptionally unusual um you know we're big on the planet in in my family but they are so much more up to speed with all of all of these things than me and i think that is quite symptomatic not symptomatic but i think it's it's how they are more they're more in tune with the planet the environment that responsible nurse mm. um and i i got so much hope for that generation and the centennials and of course the others that that are coming up so they can really help to improve our situation and not tolerate as much and just create a safer happier and more prosperous world definitely i think it's the access to information like the the open access to information about what being not unsustainable can do to the planet is is out there now and even if, if i look at my nieces and nephews in in junior school they're being educated about sustainability and i i think it's definitely yeah. i i agree yeah. it's, it's just something that's going to be more prevalent for the the future generations yeah. so just on that idea of people and and yeah as you, and as you said as you spoke about um one of the things i really wanted to focus on in in this podcast was you know, your ad your advocacy for diversity and increasing like female presence in cybersecurity um yes. industry overall yeah. like when did you kind of start noticing this gender dis disparity obviously it, it's still going on like you said and kind of why in your eyes does it matter that there's diversity in kind of the cybersecurity space yeah so i first started noticing it probably in about 2015 2015 when i i I wrote about it. I wrote a blog that I'd been meaning to to write, but I picked up an IC squared report and saw that the numbers had really dropped. I think they dropped from about 19% down to 11%. And it was a consistent workforce study report that had been done like multiple, multiple years. I think every two years they, they issued this report. And I was really shocked because when I came into security all those years ago, you really didn't find women in the industry at all. I'm, I remember like meeting a, a female client once and it was like, wow, this is amazing. It just doesn't happen. And but by that time, I knew so many more women. So I was just really shocked at the low numbers. <laughs> but then I could see them plateauing. And I thought, you know, that's not a really good sign. And that's really why I took action. And um and, you know, it just led me down a path that I didn't expect to to go, you know, down or a journey on. 
And um, and so and that's like how the book started and really my investigation into it. Well, why do women matter? You know, because every sector, every industry that you look at, people are saying, yeah, we want more women. You know, if there are less women in that industry or sector, then, you know, they're, they're usually working hard to try and improve that. But why? You know, it's it's nice to have more women. It feels better if we have more women. It's more natural. You know, women can add to the diversity of, of thinking, you know, of in terms of experience and, and things like that, because they have unique experiences. But for me, the big one is that we see risk in a different way to men. So women see risk in a different way to men. And there have been hundreds of reports that look into this. You can look at the World Economic Forum, who actually have been tracking this for years. You know, I don't know how long, but a long time. And you can put in a criteria to the Global Risk Perceptions report just to see, well, how do women's risk uh, views differ to, to men? And it's interesting, you know, so um, if we don't evaluate risk, um, including women, we're going to be out in terms of our risk management and assessing risk and reducing risk in cybersecurity with the work that we do is is what is what we're all about. So it makes sense. If you're short on women, you're you're not uh, you've got an issue with risk. So that's why it's really important. Women are not naturally suspicious. Um, <laughs> I would say inquisitive are, rather than suspicious. <laughs> I think we're naturally suspicious. We we. <laughs> we can hone into the detail yeah we spot things that just don't seem right and yeah. there are many many theories on on why that is um which you know i, I don't need to go into because i'll probably cause an argument um but i think we're, we're naturally cautious which comes down to the how we're evaluating risk and we see it in a different different way we're naturally cautious suspicious we have high emotional intelligence. It is not that all women have that and men don't, but typically um, the, these are traits that, that women have. These all add to us doing a much better job, you know, in terms of um, reducing attacks and, and protecting environments um, better. Also, if we have more women in our organizations, if, if our if bad actors are exploiting us through attacks that men are more likely to fall for than, than women, then again, it's it, there's some bolstering there. It's just like women might not fall for the same types types of attacks. Um, so there are many advantages to to bringing women in, which I go into in, in the book. So in my book, Insecurity, there are like 200 data points on on, on why women see risk in a, in a different way to men and what we need to do to improve the situation. So that book really is a manifesto, a call to action for all people. And it's incredibly inclusive, you know, from readers um, who are young, you know, children, teens, all the way through to people who aren't in our industry, who now understand our industry and the challenges that, that we have. So I've had some guys give it to their kids, um, their wives, you know, so a whole variety of, of different people. And importantly, you know, with with the book, what it really helped to do, which I was um, quite unaware of when I when I wrote that book, which was a research project, essentially, was how alone women were feeling. So it's really helped women to not feel alone, and it's just and, and not wrong. It's just like oh, it's not just me. Oh, that happened to you too. So it was really unifying in a very positive way. Yeah, that, and I think that's that's a really good point. I, I think the main factor of you know, I, I have these conversations personally at home, like women in general, just give balance to, I want to say men's brashness, that's probably the best way to phrase it, where we kind of go head in and don't really take into account every single thing on the side. Whereas the women that I've worked with, and are, are in my life, they're also methodical, and they see all the step by steps that I would just miss on, on a common basis. And I'm really thankful to work with them, um, and have those people in my life. So yeah, I completely agree. I definitely need to uh, have a read of Insecurity. Uh, it sounds like something that I, I'd actually quite enjoy. Yes, and I mean, I need to add some more research in there as well because more research has been done. You know, there is little research out there. You know, specifically when we're looking at cybersecurity and risk risk management and the difference that gender diversity makes or full diversity. Um, but there are some newer kind of reports that have happened since I wrote that. And I really want to get those in because 
you know, there was one that was written by Cass Business School and um, they looked at banks and the misconduct fines and they looked at um, diversity in all its forms and specifically gender diversity to see what made the difference. You know, I would have expected from all of the reports that I'd, I'd read, you know, to see it's going to be full diversity. But actually, it wasn't. It was gender diversity. That made the difference. Because of that, they were able to, to lower the risk management and the bank's misconduct fines by something like 7.48 million US, I think it was US dollars per year. So that's just one. Now, we need more, you know, more um, sources of data to be able to build a picture to kind of car car categorically say, OK, this is the impact that that can be made, which then enables us to get more companies to invest in it as opposed to just paying lip service um, or wanting to look like they do care about it um, through branding and marketing efforts and things like that, whilst not actually changing or doing much to to change the situation. Of course, of course. So outside of that ideal of uh, kind of inclusivity and diversity, would you say there are any other changes to cybersecurity that would be top of your list? What what would be the one thing if you could snap your fingers and make the change? What would it be? Uh, better leadership. You know, it's always, <laughs> it's always better leadership. I yeah. mess up quite a lot, and yeah, better better leadership. I like leaders to, and I don't want to put upon the leaders because they're doing an incredibly hard, pressurized. Uh, it, it's it is so tough out there. They are bombarded i mean they have their whole adversaries within the organizations you know the um so it's it's really difficult for them but an investment in in leadership i would like to see that change because i think they there's an opportunity for leaders to really change the situation so uh from from down you know from where they're leading through their teams and through to employees within their organizations and then up as well so it's just like you've got such an opportunity you invest you know, you get the investment that you need in order to improve your leadership or you invest in, in yourself. That would be a big difference. And um, I need leaders to be more open and not to be closed off. You know, it's that fixed mindset because I hear them saying one thing, but then I see them being closed yep. off. You know, so I want them to be much more open, much more collaborative. Uh, yeah. And, and listen, listen better, listen better and then take action. Would you say that, you know, that idea of people that are actually making active changes, but, you know, behind closed up doors, they're not actually making those changes. Would you say that that's kind of a commonly held belief that you, like is your main thing that you disagree with about the industry? Or do you have another kind of common cybersecurity belief that you passionately disagree about? So, yeah, I think some people it's not, you know, if we're talking about women, women in cyber, it's just not enough of a priority. You know, they've got to. They've got to lower their attacks, you know. So here comes a, a requisition from HR or diversity, equity and inclusion or, you know, an ESG metric that they have to meet. And it's just like, oh, for goodness sake, it's compliance for them. You know, so e even if they do believe in it and want it, they've just got a hell of a lot of a job to do. It's just like, well, we, we, we need deliverables. You know, we've got to find someone to do this. And like, there aren't enough women. So where are we going to find them? And we don't have time and we're going to lose business or we're going to be attacked and so on. So it is it is really hard on, on them. And then also if they are facing the, the issue of not having enough budget, not having enough buy-in from their stakeholders, whether that's, um, you know, finance officers or, other MDs or partners um, or CEOs in the business, then it, they can be blocked. So it's like, I want to make this change, but you're not allowing me to make this change. And I, I, this is going nowhere. So I see a lot of, um, I see a lot of tenures that aren't long, they're short tenures. So two year tenures, and, and that is just not acceptable, because a new person comes in, they start again, and it's just absolute madness. And particularly so, you know, certainly if I was um, a company with and seeing this pattern, this trend going on, a CEO of a company, I'd be asking the question, what the hell are we doing? You know, why can't we keep these these um, CISOs, these heads of security? Why are they going within two years or just after two years? You know, what's going on when CIOs 
and last for about five years on average, I think. And the average tenure of someone is is about four years, you know, so, mm. so wasteful. It's so non-productive and you just get different solutions coming in and more money and time being wasted. So it's not good. Of course, of course. And maybe something for the younger listeners or people at the start of their cyber security career, like if you could go back and give your younger self some cybersecurity advice today, what would that be? That's such a hard question. I I really need to like <laughs> think about it. Like, oh yeah. Well, it would be it would be to be more visible. You know, so I if I think about my younger self, you know, I pushed everybody else forward. I kept out of the limelight. I was really scared, scared to speak to any press journalist speak you know I only became a speaker not that long ago it was my biggest biggest fear I'm an introvert I'm actually a very shy person (laughs) which so many people find hard to believe um but it would be to to really um yeah get more visible like invest in that and and stretch yourself so that you've got that as a skill uh because you need it in in today's world it's it's a useful skill to to have so yeah, probably don't be so fear fearful. Yeah. I, I was like the person behind the camera. I, yeah. that type of person, you know, rather than like say, don't pick me, I don't want to do it. No, push everyone else forward. So whereas I've had to become like that and, and I did become like that because I knew it was important for the mission. So the mission helped me to find the courage. Um, you know, because it's something that I, I believed in. So it's understand your why. And what you want, you know, what you're passionate about, what your mission is, if you have one, if you don't, that's fine. Um, but get more visible, use your voice and uh, build those skills. Definitely something I tell my team uh, at Soaks is, is definitely do not be afraid to rock the boat um, because that's how you that's how you make the changes in, in your industry. Yes, but some companies and individuals don't like that. Some, you know, I've I've worked at places where they don't like challenges. They just mm. want yes people. And if you're not a yes person, or you raise your head above the parapet, then it's just like there's the door out you go because they just want yes people. So you've got to find the right environment for you. Um, it's really really important so that you can you can come and be yourself. You know, be you at the source. My platform for women in cyber. We say be you in the workplace. You know, that's one of our mantras. Be you in the workplace. That's what we want. We want that belonging. We don't want that fitting in. We want to be able to come and be ourselves without hiding. Of course, of course. I mean, that's the last question that I had from our main questions. We do have three final questions before we sign off, and it's what we will ask all of our guests. Uh, The first one is, in the world of data, if you could pick anyone either who's past or still living, who would you take out to lunch? I don't know. I don't know anyone in the world of data. I'm trying. What about in the world of cybersecurity? Then is there anyone that you would like to sit down and and pick their brain for for an hour over lunch? In cyber, no, but there's lots of people I'd like to catch up with in cyber. It's like, yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. We can skip over that question. Our second question is software. Okay, so what app piece of software could you not live without on a daily basis? Well, I'm really enjoying um, chat. Chat GPT, GPT. yeah. Yeah, I really am. It's just, it's fun. It's just like, oh, wow. So exploring, exploring that at the moment and really like seeing its capabilities, just having a play. I'm really enjoying playing with that bit of software at the the moment. Brilliant. And you being kind of, like you said, a bit of a, a, a data enthusiast when it comes to solving problems, have you ever used a set of data to solve a real world problem? Could be in a workplace, in a professional environment, or it can be in a personal environment, uh, maybe around the house or something like that. Well, I, I think it comes back to the insecurity movement. So the research that I'm doing there. So yes, that that's led by research, by data. Mm-hmm. So the surveys, so the harassment, um, it would be nice to think that, yes, that all started and was solved by by the data. You know, it's like, what's the problem? What's going on? How do we solve it? So, yeah. Brilliant. I think, I think data is a bit like a seed. Of course. It's like seed. Yeah. It's definitely more of a journey, like the starting point of a journey. than uh, And and it's something that will keep growing and gaining insight on. And um, yeah, yeah. it's definitely something that doesn't stay stagnant for too long. Yes. 
<laughs> Brilliant. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. And thank you all the listeners for tuning in this week. And Jane, uh, do you have any final messages you want to leave with our listeners? Um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for having me. It's been absolutely wonderful to speak to you and to answer your excellent questions. It's been so much, so much fun. That That's all from me. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, guys. Um, it was great to, to have you all listen in. And um, you can catch us next time on Ethical Data Explained. Thank you. Ethical Data Explained is brought to you by Soaks, a reputable provider of premium residential and mobile proxies, a gateway to data worldwide at scale. Make sure to search for Ethical Data Explained in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found, and hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. On behalf of the team here at Soaks, thanks for listening.